ओके सो वी आर सपोज टू वेट फॉर द फर्स्ट फाइव मिनिट्स जस्ट क्लिक टू द टाइम दैट यू आर सपोज टू स्टार्ट बट वी हैव टू वेट फॉर फाइव मिनिट्स द फर्स्ट फाइव मिनिट्स फॉर पार्टिसिपेंट्स टू जॉइन सो वील हैव टू जस्ट वेट फॉर फाइव मोर मिनिट्स दैन एट ट्वेल्व फॉर फाइव एन एरोबी टाइम वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट विद नाउ द एजेंडा Hi everyone. So for those who just joined, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really um happy for this and we are really looking forward to this um, meetup that we have planned. As uh, Dr. Susan is already here and uh we're just waiting few minutes around 5 minutes uh for participants to join. Um and then we are going to start off with the agenda. Uh but in the meantime just um Feel free to just mention your name, uh, which country you're joining from, uh, and what you do, uh, if you like. Just within the five minutes, uh, as we as we wait for, actually the next three minutes, uh, as we wait for the others to join. Thank you. Thank you, Janelle, for joining us from Norway. Yeah, we're really hoping um, <laughs> that uh, we all learn something major from this meetup. Thank you, thank you for joining us. So for those who just joined us, um, welcome, welcome to today's meetup. Um, uh, it's a collaboration um, between Our Ladies Nairobi, Our Ladies Tunis, Our Ladies Juzi, uh, Josi, Our Ladies Abuja, and Our Ladies Ajaz. Uh, and today's speaker is Dr. Susan. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. So that is the agenda that we have for today. We're just waiting uh, one more minute for participants to join. Um, and then we're just going to start off and then the rest can join us on the way. Uh, in the meantime, I hope that uh, you got my email yesterday uh, with the prolificides as a short code uh, 
of the packages you needed to install on your computers for you to be able to follow through today's meetup. So if you have not, kindly just do that because uh, we're not going to put aside some time for that. Uh, we just uh, hope to really get the maximum from uh, today's uh, meetup with Susan. Um, also, in case you have any questions, uh, feel free to just ask them on the chat. Um, then uh, jo uh, Josie organizers are going to uh, to uh, to summarize them or group the questions, and then we we'll have a thirty minutes uh, question and answer session after uh, Dr. Susan's talk. So please feel free to to just type your questions in the chat. Uh, uh, whichever time during the, the the talk that you're going to have. So I think according to my watch, uh, we are right on time. Uh, it's 12 or 5 here at Nairobi. And we are going to start off uh, with the people that have joined. Hope uh, the others will join. And uh, those who will not be able to do that, uh, they'll be able to watch the recorded uh, recording on YouTube. So thank you so much. Um, my name is Faith Musili. Uh, I am a co-organizer of Our Ladies Nairobi. And uh, we as the organizers and all the collaborating groups are really happy that you joined us today, um, that you spent the time to do this. We really hope that you're going to learn something great together today, uh, that you're going to apply in our different fields. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just going to take you through the agenda. Uh, so the first five minutes were to for participants to join. Uh, we have done that. So now we're just in the session of welcoming you and outlining the agenda um, that you're going to have. And uh, I'll be doing that uh, from Aladis Nairobi. Uh, and then uh, Billy Kiss, who is an organizer of Aladis Abuja, uh, is going to introduce uh, the collaborating groups and all the organizers. Um, and then uh, Haifa from Our Ladies Tunis uh, is going to introduce uh, Dr. Susan. And uh, then we're going to give Dr. Susan one hour to take us through this topic of networks and graphs in, uh, for biology in R. And then uh, Vebashni and Inga, who are organizers of, of Our Ladies Josie, are uh, going to lead the Q&A session uh, with uh, Dr. Susan. Uh, and then after that, uh, we are going to launch Our Ladies Africa new logo that uh, we hope uh, this is going to be the initial and the first meetup. Uh, and for going forward, you're going to have more than this that we have collaborated all of us. So uh, Camila, who is an organizer of Our Ladies Ages, is going to take us through that. Uh, and then she's going to give us the closing remarks. So that's just an outline of the agenda that you're going to have today. Uh, and we really hope uh, that uh, we all participate. Feel free to ask questions uh, in case you have any on the chat. Kindly uh, do not uh, unmute uh, when uh, either of the people are talking. Uh, just type your questions on the chat for just have to, to have a good format and to avoid interruptions in the meantime. So thank you so much. Um, so Billy Kisu. Are you there? I just want to help you navigate the slides as you introduce the collaborating groups and organizers of today's meetup. Okay, hello everyone. Okay. Okay, so the collaborating groups are Our Ladies Nairobi. We have Lucy Njoki who is a biostatistician, Margaret Wanjuri, a financial risk analyst, Faith Musili, senior data analyst, while we have um, Shalmit Kariuki, a senior data analyst and co-organizer of R Africa and Nairobi R. Next, we have um, Our Lady Sabuja, that's me, Belikisu Wongi Adenito, I'm a business data analyst. So we have Our Ladies Tunis, we have um, Mona Belaid, data scientist, um, Haifa Bin Misaud, a senior data scientist. Um, we have um, Kauthar Dries, 
was also a data scientist, engineer, and an ML researcher. Ahmed Bridi, the graphic designer, web designer, and photographer. Amir Susi, consultant data scientist, and an R instructor. Hannah Gulifi, sorry for that, a master student in business analytics at Tunis Business School. Hello, Biliki, so I Nora can't hear. Nora Mac sorry, this slide is gone. Sorry, this slides. Oh my God, sorry, uh, something really happened to my internet, I'm sorry for that. Um, so. Okay, I'll continue from here. Host, just one of the co-hosts must make me a co-host for me to be able to share them back. I kindly do that. Sorry, 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 sorry for this. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, okay, sorry, go okay. ahead. Okay, so I'll take this through. So Noor El Huda Makni, junior data scientist, um, Hamed Amri, data analyst and R Shiny developer, Heida Tinani, sorry, a postdoctoral fellow at Pasteur Institute of Tunis. And we have Marian Zuha, that's a digital marketer. So we'll go to our ladies audience. We have Benadruch, Camila, an economic engineer. Our ladies Josie, we have Vebashini, Naidu, Inja Fabrice Rotelli, sorry for that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm trying, Bilikisu. sorry. <laughs> Billy Kisu for that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and sorry for my network mess up. Um, so we're just going to uh, Haifa from Al Ladies Tunis, who's going to introduce our trainer today. Dr. Susan Holmes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are all honored to have with us uh, Dr. Susan. Uh, she is trained in the French School of Data Analysis in Montpellier and has been working in non-parametric multivariate statistics applied to biology since 1985. She has taught at Mead, Harvard, and was an associate professor of biometry at Cornell before moving to Stanford in 1998. She also created the Thinking Matters classes, uh, breaking codes and finding patterns, and likes working on big, messy data sets, mostly from the area of uh, immunology, cancer biology, and uh, microbial ecology. Her, her uh, theoretical interests include uh, applied uh, probability, Monte Carlo Markov chains, uh, graph limit theory, differential geometry, and the topology of the space of uh, phylogenetic streets. Uh, she wrote the book Modern Statistics for Modern Biology with Wolfing Harbor from EMBL and teaches the materials as uh, a crash course in bio, uh, BIOS uh, 221, uh, and uh, this is regularly every year. Uh, her current for, uh, focus is uh, to improve the statistical analysis and reproducibility of data in perturbation studies of the human microbiome. Uh, Dr. Susan, uh, Susan is uh, a professor in statistics, and she is also a member of uh, in uh, BioX uh, Maternal and Child Health Research Institute, MCHRI, 
and member in Wu Tsai uh, Neurosciences Institute. Uh, she is also a co-director mathematical and computational science IDP uh, from 2002 to uh, 2017. She is a director uh, in VIRGE uh, program in statistics from 20, uh, 25 to 2040. Uh, 14. Uh, she is professor member in BioX from uh, 203 uh, uh, until present. Uh, she has uh, a lot of honors and awards, like uh, the, CI, uh, the CA uh, CSBS Fellow, the Center for Advanced Study of the Behavior Sciences uh, in uh, 2017 uh, to 2018. Uh, Bremen lecture uh, in an IPS uh, in December uh, 260, uh, Philo Fields Institute in Mathematical Sciences uh, uh, of Toronto, Canada in 2015, uh, Director Transformed Research Award uh, NIYH in 2030, uh, John Henry um, Sumter University Fellow in Undergraduate uh, Education, Stanford 2012, and uh, the Fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, IMS, in 25. Uh, she is also a member and chair uh, of Science Board uh, and I am BIOS uh, from 20, uh, 27 to 2012. Uh, a science board field research institute in the mathematical sciences of uh, from 2012 to uh, 2015 and she is a council member in the institute of mathematical statistics from uh, 2018 to present uh, she is uh, also uh, affiliate in the symbolic system program so welcome uh, dr susan and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me stop sharing. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Susan. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I have been using R for a... Uh, um, a very long time. When I came to Stanford in 1998, it only existed on um, Unix, Linux machines. And so I've been trying to keep up to date with all the improvements is quite hard. And I'd like to share um, some of the work I'm trying to do on networks. And I made um, some material available. I can't say that it's perfect, uh, but at least uh, I hope that you were able to download for, from GitHub. So now I'm going to share uh, my screen so that you can see some of the material and, and where it is. So is that okay? Are you seeing the... So this is the, this is the page where I have um, the GitHub uh, repo, um, which is um, a graphs tutorial, and it uses the Learn R package to have interactive um, windows where you can enter some of the code. If you weren't able to install um, the tutorial from GitHub, it doesn't matter. You can also follow along. Um, I put a version of the slides up um, at a website that you could um, you, um, uh, um, use. And so let me, I was going to, um, Let's see if I can do this. Um, just to make it easier for you, let me put this um, maybe in the, I don't have access to the chat. So maybe one of you could put that um, in the chat so that you could just um, look at the link. I don't have access to the chat right now. So um, that would be, um, that's good. Oh, here, here it is. Sorry, sorry, there we go, okay. That's, uh, um, that's great. So, so let me start with um, sort of the motivation of where I'm coming from. 
Um, so I work in uh, statistics for biology, and that's something that uh, I'm really excited to share. That is, uh, of course, that's what I like to do the most is biology and networks. And I have written a book and the book's available online. Let me just um, show you how it is. Um, and this book is available um, for free as HTML. And we wrote it with Wolfgang. Um, we actually wrote it six or seven years ago um, using only R and bioconductor packages, but the cap packages move a lot. They change a lot over time. And so if you want to look at um, the chapter I'm going to talk about, it's called the chapter on networks and trees. And networks and trees are really important in biology. Uh, on the right, you have the picture that Darwin wrote in his net in his notebook, it was the only picture he drew, and it's what we call a phylogenetic tree. It's the tree of relationships between different species and um, with their common ancestors here as these nodes. And these nodes appear in what we call a graph. And so graphs are really important. Um, in biology as they are in social sciences, for instance, the graph of interactions between people. And I um, find it useful to do all of my work in R and graphs are special structures. Um, we have a need to plot them and to manipulate them in R. And so here, this is a graph, which is the interaction between different genes. So the labels here have a meaning, they're genes and they might be expressed together or they might inhibit each other or forbid each other. So the edges might mean different things, but the graph um, represents the interactions. So what I'm going to talk about um, has a lot to do with this chapter, although I tried to update it somewhat because um, in the original, there's a sort of base R for graphs. So you know about ggplot and um, the difference with base plotting. Well, there's a sort of base plot and base um, R for graphs, and that's iGraph. And here we're going to look also, we'll look at iGraph as the sort of basis of the structure, but there's implementations. Um, there's one called ggnetwork, and there's also one called ggraph, which are ggplot2 or tidyverse implementations for graphs. So we'll talk about that. And I won't have a lot of time to talk about phylogenetic trees in the first part. If you ask me questions, we'll come back to that. I will talk about um, one special tree, which is very useful in looking at um, making graphs from data, and that's called the minimum spanning tree. And so I'll do some examples about um, the minimum spanning tree. So let me go back to my um, slides here that I made and my little introduction. So if you have the, um, uh, uh, the tutorial, you can follow along and inter interact with the code. Um, if you don't have the tutorial up, it doesn't matter, you can follow on the slides. And so there are some required libraries, the standard ones for doing anything which has to do with the tidyverse is a set of libraries, the tidyverse set. And then um, as I said, the iGraph library is the one that has um, special objects which are of a graph type and have attributes which are graph attributes. And then finally, I will also use a package which I developed, um, which we have made for looking at graphs in the context of the microbiome. So I best said, you know, I am interested in the microbiome and that's something that um, I find very important. It's about all the bacteria that occur in the gut. And we manipulate a lot of data which are, are of a heterogeneous kind. Um, when we look at these, um, we often have graphs and we might have graphs of, I'm going to look at co-occurrence of graph of samples. That is um, samples which are similar because they have the same bacteria in them. And then we make a graph of them. So in order to do that, this package is a little bit different. Um, if you haven't used the bioconductor package, they install differently. They're not, they don't sit on CRAN. They sit in uh, bioconductor.org um, and we install them 
which works called the BioC Manager, and you have BioC Manager install and then PhiloSeq. So that, that enables you to install that particular package. Uh, so what is a graph? Let's start with the elements that we're going to talk about. Um, they have different names. And the first part is we have a number of nodes. And here, in this case, I have six different nodes or vertices. And they, they have numbers in this uh, representation. Some of the time we have graphs where we don't have anything important to say about those nodes. And somet sometimes we have graphs where we consider covariates which exist on these nodes. And the covariates may have an influence on whether or not there are edges. So the other part of a graph are the edges which relate um, to nodes. So in this case, um, the graph that I'm showing you is called an undirected graph. And there are no arrows that go from one node to the other. Sometimes we have directed graphs in which we have arrows. So that depends. So this is what we call a small graph. Um, graphs have a tendency to be quite large. And um, their size actually is the reason for which we don't usually represent them as matrices. So technically, I could uh, write a 0, 1 matrix of size 6 by 6 and put in a 1 every time um, I have connected two nodes. So here, in this case, I have 1 and 3 are connected. I put a 1 here. And 3 and 1 are connected also because this is a undirected graph, so we have a symmetric matrix. So I could represent um, the graph with what we call the adjacency matrix. But if you had 10,000 nodes, as we often do in a graph, this is not um, very economical because it would be um, of order n squared. So the standard way of representing the graph internally in R is to write down an edge set. So we have a set of graphs. But this is what the adjacency matrix looks like if I put in colorings, for instance, for each of the nodes. So all of these three things um, are equivalent. And um, so that, that's one way of looking at a graph. But how would you plot it or how do we manipulate it in R? So we used to start with a package called iGraph. And then we have the definition of the matrices. So in this case, um, I have edges. And um, I'm going to make a matrix of two row, two columns. And I'm going to enter the edges in those two columns. So you could actually um, execute that within a window just to have a look. Um, let me just, I'm going, I'm going to do it so that you can, oh, well, let's see. I'm not very good at this, but we'll, we'll see. Um, so if I look at the, I'm just going to, and I encourage you to, to do some, you know, live coding at the same time. I think it's more helpful to, to actually experience what we get. But this is what the edges um, matrix looks like. This is the list of edges. And so they, there's no direction in this case because we have an undirected graph. And there are various functions for creating the graphs in iGraph. And you could create the graph from the edge list or you could create it from an adjacency matrix. In this case, I'm doing it from a, uh, uh, an adjacency, uh, I'm doing it from an edge list. So here where I, I have the, and then I can plot it. And when I plot it um, here, this is the plot that I get. And so you should play, definitely play around with this to see um, what, what you can change. So for instance, if I wanted to change the color, um, I could make this um, purple if I wanted to. So here I have purple and then um, it, it, you, you see um, the, the, the nodes are there. So what we have here is a way of plotting um, the graph. And you see, I just 
used an ordinary plot function. That is, it's a base. That's why I say it's sort of a base R um, choice. Now I could make changes. I could label the nodes differently if I wanted to. So for instance, I could look at what the edges are or the ver vertices are, they're attributes in some sense. So I could look at, um, I could change the attributes and I'm going to maybe change them into uh, letters. So I could uh, make them uh so for g1 i could change uh the name so here this is an attribute so the name and i could put in letters and then i can plot again um i could just just plot it uh if i just plot it without doing anything you should try this out for yourself but um g1 and what does it do? Why well, it puts in the letters, okay? That I just changed the label so that you have these attributes, which are letters, and then I change them. And this one, of course, has the edge size, which is smaller because that's the default. And if I wanted to change something, I would. Now, what? how would we find out, actually, how do I change things in this plotting function? Well, if I just do question mark plot, um, then it would give me all the different plotting. The type of plotting, which is, um, which matches the graph. Um, in this case, the class. So what's the class of G1? It's an I graph. And so here you can ask, you know, plot um, I graph, how does that work? And so if you did just plot, it would give you the general plotting. In this case, it's for the plotting of graphs. And that's where you see all the different um, choices that you have in this. And you can look at all the, the things that you have to decide upon. Of course, everything is being done by default. And one of the most important things that we'll come back to, not for little graphs, but for big graphs, is what's called the layout. That is where there are various choices are made about how to lay out the graph so that it doesn't, um, so it's as clear as possible. And uh, so, so this is just a, you know, a, a little example. And if you want to try in your, um, in the, in, in the program. So here um, I've called it, um, so it, 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 you can change, you can interact with this. I'm not going to interact too much with the, with the, the, the code. I'm just using my, um, open window here, but if you want to, you should be able to run the code and try that out. Now, um, there are other ways. So I just showed you one way of entering um, lists, but there are other ways of, you can enter edges, you and you should try this out for yourself and define um, the graph from edge, ed edge list as well. So that's just a little exercise to try out to see how you um, define the graph um, yourself. So the, the elements that we have, um, you see you have the vertex and then you have dot label dot color. And I could also change the edge by putting an edge uh, color. For instance, here, it's a vertex color, but I could have changed the edge color as well. The default edge color, which has appeared is gray, but you could try changing that. Um, and we sometimes put in variables for the edge width or variables for the nodes. And we're going to see that. And in order to so distinguish in some sense between the case where we have all these annotations for the graph, um, um, I'm going to also um, call it a network. So here for a graph, we have nodes and we have edges. And for a network, we're going to have uh, annotations. So what is a network? I just say that it's a weighted 
often directed graph. Um, the networks also have adjacency matrices, but instead of being zero one, they have quantities in them, um, which give you the length of the edges. And they also have covariance or attributes which can be associated to the nodes, but they could be also, you know, in the case of genes, we have positive or negative effects of genes one on the other. So you might have a different attribute for an edge uh, um, apart from its length. Now, I would like to use a real example from biology. So there are lots of databases which provide this um, facility. And so there's a database um, in, uh, called uh, String, which you can go and look at. Um, there we are. Okay, there's the string database. And I could search in this for, I, you know, I, I could look at a chymokine uh, 10, for instance. Uh, so. And this is a database. Uh oh, I made one up, so it's not a good idea. Um, IL6. So in this case, it gives you proposal. So this is the one I want, um, the first one that comes from the human, and this is a network. And so this is showing me my um, interleukin-6 and how it's related to other genes. And you see, this is how you could get a network. And you might want to export that network so that you could use it in R. And there are various ways. So it used to be metabolic networks and gene-gene interaction networks were just represented as pictures, as pings, but you couldn't use the data. And now, of course, I'd like them to be downloadable, um, but not as a picture, rather as say, um, uh, tab separated values or just um, a flat, flat file. Um, so they're just, I could, I'm just going to show you this, how, how it works so that you could do it for yourself. But this is how we get this type of data. So this is to say that when um, I'm showing you this example, this is how I obtain the data that I'm going to talk about. So the table that I have came from um, String, the database, and it's a small chemokine network which comes in when we study immunology. And you can read this in as a table, um, as a text file, as a CSV. It depends um, what you made it into. And here, in this case, I, I, I'm just going to read it in as a text file, as a read table. And this is the beginning of the data. So if I look at um, what I have is I have 20 rows and 15 columns. And some of the columns are actually from the string choices um, and they have to do with how much we believe the edges. And I'm not going to put that data in for now. Really what I'm going to be interested in is how do I make a graph given the first two columns, which are node one and node two, those are the edges. Now the graph that I've made in this case is undirected. So it doesn't matter the order of node one and node two, but you could have um, um, orderings, which would give you orientation of the edges. So what does each row here correspond to? And that was the question um, for you to think about. Um, and so all the information here is given row by row. And so in some sense, I'm asking the question, what, how many, what are the objects of which there are 20 in this graph? Because my size of my data set is 20 and 15, and I'm asking every row. Um, so the answer to that is that there are 20, edges. That is, in this case, every row corresponds to an edge. That's the element um, that, um, that we have. And this, uh, one of the ways of getting a graph from a data frame is to tell it, I only want the first two columns, the two nodes, 
And this is a, less, a list of edges. So this is the default. Now I'm not going to use any edge weights and I'm going to put in a weight of one just to make an ordinary graph. And then I'd like to put in a little bit of a variable about how central uh, it could be or what the degree was or how important an vertices are. And so I'll put this in as my, um, as my extra variable. So this um, is a degree computation and I'm going to use that size variable so that it appears on the graph. And then I saved it so that you save it for later on, but you can plot it. So you can try this code and you can start it over or you can change it a little bit. You could change the weights. But what you see is here, um, this node, which corresponds to CD444, is very small. And this node is very big, the CCR7. And that's because it has a high degree. It's central in some sense. So it's what we sometimes call in the, in when we're exploring the graph, um, we'd call that a hub if it has a much higher degree. And then here we have the labels. So if you wanted to um, look at more in detail about plotting, as I said, you can use the help um, plot graph help and see how, for instance, I might want to make these uh, larger or multiply the value of the degree by two and then plot it again. So let's see if I'm allowed to do this. Um, this is new for me to be able to interact directly with the slides. I'm not exactly um, sure, but well, let's, let's be a little bit radical so that I can see whether this is actually working. So if I run the code, oh yes, it doesn't run because it doesn't know the code directly. So, because um, I didn't put it within the chemo, um, the, the data. So I, I, it's because I haven't been running the code one by one. So I, I didn't, um, so that it's probably better if I do it from within the, my, ah, uh, my, ah, uh, uh. And that's my fault because I'm not used to using learner going back and forth. So I should have gone um, back. Let's see if I can cheat a little bit. Um, so if I go back, sorry, huh? bear with me here. Sorry about that. Let's see if I can actually cut and paste and make it get better. Um, okay, let me see. That's, let's see if I can run this code. It might not be able to because I might not be able to go out from the shiny uh, into a website, but it turns out that that worked out. So I was able to go out from the, the, the shiny. It's because I didn't um, put it into the original code. But you see, I did obtain what I wanted, which was to blow up the vertices uh, as three times the degree instead of uh, being just the degree so that they're bigger. Uh, 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 you can change that. It's just to show you how you interact with that. Okay, so that's uh, making a graph from lists and nodes. And um, this is um, now uh, you can wonder about um, creating a graph from data. So I just showed you, I got the graph from the string database and my starting point was the graph. It was the list of edges. That doesn't happen a lot. Most of the time uh, we actually have to make our own graphs. So we make our own graphs usually from matrices of distances between points. And there are different ways which, in which that can occur. You could threshold the distance and decide to connect two points together if they're close. So if the distance is smaller than a certain amount, and we'll see an example of that. And then there's finding a spanning tree between points which is quite a useful thing to do. So I'm going to show you that example and talk to you about minimum spanning trees. Now, in this case, um, I can uh, 
do a computation using a minimum spanning t function and let's see what that does. So first of all, what is a spanning tree? If you have points and you have distances between the points, a spanning tree is a path that goes through all the points um, and is, so it has to go through all the points. So it could be um, quite long. There are different paths that go through. So it mustn't have any loops. So it's a tree. That's the difference with an ordinary graph. So there are no loops. It has to be a tree. Um, but we don't put any constraint on how long it is. And then there's the minimum spanning tree, which is the best or shortest path tree. And so in this case, it goes through all the points. We don't create extra points, but we make it so that it's of minimum length. So this is called the minimum spanning tree. The computation, the algorithms for computing minimum spanning trees are actually cheap. So many things to do with computing graphs are expensive. Um, sometimes when I say expensive, it's um, as a function of the number of points, they can be high polynomials or even what we call NP complete, they can be very expensive to do. Certain optimization problems which involve graphs. But in the case of the minimum spanning tree, it's very cheap. And there are lots of implementations of um, what's called Prim's algorithm, which is a greedy algorithm for computing the minimum spanning tree. And here I'm just listing a few. In the iGraph package, you have MST in the eight package, it's also called MSD. AD4, it's called MS tree. Um, vegan, um, we have span tree and, um, and the SPDP MS tree. So we're going to compute a minimum spanning tree and I'm going to show you the problem I'd like to solve. So this is a problem which has to do with my research um, on HIV. And in this data, what we had was um, we had samples that were collected of strains of HIV, and we knew which uh, countries the HIV strains were taken from. So this, today, um, if I was doing um, a study of COVID, I could also do such a graph. And that would be a great challenge for some of you if you're interested in doing a sort of research uh, a little problem. It would be to go into one of the databases such as uh, GSIAID and get the DNA um, and then compute the DNA distances between different strains and do the same thing that I'm going to show you um, that we did with HIV. So I, I took some data. Here I've loaded the data and um, I have data, as I said, it's from different countries. So they're going to be the labels. And then from this distance matrix, I'm going to find the minimum spanning tree of those um, strains. So the distance I'm minimizing and the choice is um, arbitrary. There are many different distances that you can compute between samples. So in this case, I've taken a DNA um, distance, uh, distance which just looks as the changes in the DNA um, between the different strains of HIV. And I create an adjacency matrix for this uh, minimum spanning tree. And I'm going to try and um, plot it in different ways. And so this is an opportunity for me to show you um, better plotting and layouts than um, what the default happens when you have a small graph and you don't care. Um, the, the choice um, of layout in the different algorithms, um, there's a standard one which sort of stretches out the graph um, as much as possible. And that's called Frutman um, Reinwald. And but there are many other choices. So this layout choice, you're going to have um, to choose it yourself. And so th this is, um, this would appear, um, and where? Okay, so I'm just going to choose it in, um, so I'm going to put up library uh, GG network, for instance, which is one of the libraries I'm going to choose. And then uh, if I say, 
um, it's all plot um, GG network. Um, I don't know whether it's going to tell me about the um, it, uh, layout. So if I do in iGraph, it's the same. It, it inherits about the um, in the iGraph package. We're going to look at all the different ways of doing iGraph plotting. And in the plotting, um, the thing that's going to come up is the, um, the choice of how you do the layout. So the plot iGraph um, and ggGraph and all of those, um, they're, they're all going to be different choices of algorithms of how you spread out a graph. And it will depend on the size of the graph. So I'm trying to find out where um, the plot iGraph options. I want to find out where the layout uh, iGraph plotting. Then uh, there we are. OK, so the, the secret word here is layout. So you have to know to look for that. And you have many choices of layout. So layout with FR is uh, the, what I said, the fruchtemann rheingold layout algorithm. And it's what we call force-directed layout. Um, and there are other um, layouts which are very similar, which also try to force in different ways. Um, just imagine that each of the nodes in some sense was like an electron and the electrons are repulsing each other. So you want to spread things out. So that's what a layout tries to do. And let me go back to my layout, the one that I obtained. It's not very good, uh, but one of the problems that we have is the labeling. So we can see some, some of the more sparse um, points of the graph are quite readable. That is here we have on the edge, we have Nigeria several times, Mexico, um, Uganda and Kenya are here. Um, so we have different areas, but some of these are, are very badly um, overlapping. So we want to make a graph which is better. Um, you could try and use um, ggrepel, which by default will take away some of the ones which are overlapping. And so what it does is, if it's not overlapping, you see it clearly. Um, and then we put in, for instance, a color. And so here, what you see, um, which is different from when I was doing um, plot iGraph, is this is no longer a base plot. This is, um, uh, we're using the GG framework. So this is the tidyverse. And we have um, possibility of plotting and doing, adding edges and information and text in the standard um, tidyverse ggplot way. And so you can make these quite nice um, so that they're, they're not, um, they're, they're not, uh, you have much more control on the layers. So you can put in uh, quant qualifiers for the edges, for the nodes. So here I've used the categorical variable, which was country, to give the colors. And then we have a lot of points which are overlapping, and those make the blobs. And we're going to see how to deal with that. But <clears throat> this is a much clearer picture in some sense. But the layout that we see in this case doesn't have anything to do with the geography. It's a layout, which is the layout of the minimum spanning tree. And it's not trying to put the countries actually anywhere uh, near their geographic position. So we're going to change this. We're going to make another layout. And this other layout will be um, a layout which has the geography in it. And um, so <clears throat> before I do that, I was going to show you an update. So I forced myself to learn when we were writing the book with Wolfgang, the only ggplot version for graphs was called GG Network. And now there's a tidy graph and a ggraph um, um, development team. So they're uh, which is uh, much better 
um, a much more modern and it's well integrated into the tidyverse. And so I wanted to use that um, as an example for, for changing the data a little bit. And so in this case, I'm um, going to also show you the output that you would get from a G graph instead of GG network. And so in this, we have what's called a theme, a theme graph, which is um, a clear background with no extra things so that we have a, a, a better um, choice and a neater network. And I, I wanted to show you the network without the nodes so that you could see that what we saw as blobs here were in fact many, many, many edges. And um, so this is what happens. You have these little stars around the hubs. And the layout that I chose here was just a, a choice which is supposed to react um, and try and make a very clear graph. It's called layout nicely. And then if I add, that is, I make GGT, and then I add later layers. And so here I add, say, the names. And again, what you get is somewhat of a mess because um, the names are all overlaid. We get this. I might want to <coughs> add the color for the countries instead of the names. And so in this case, you have a much clearer picture. And again, we, get, we do get these blobs. So if you want to label only the countries which appear as hubs, that is those with very high degrees. So I don't really know what's going on here. So I decided to use the degree of a point as an extra variable. And in this case, <clears throat> this computation of the degree is done with the function centrality degree. And here you see I'm using pipes. So I'm using the tidyverse and the way of piping through um, instead of doing the old fashioned way. And so you, I have a degree um, which appears as a new variable for all of them. And so if you wanted to plot um, the labels with the higher degree hubs, um, I, you, know, you should try this out. And um, so here I, I put some code here, but you're going to have to enter the graph ahead of time in the code. And I'm not going to do it right now. But this gives you a way of having a better, um, a better labeling. In fact, what I wanted to do in order to try to understand what was going on with regards to travel and contagion was I wanted to map my minimum spanning tree onto the world. And in order to do that, well, there are wonderful R packages for all kinds of things, and there's a R world map. So I used the library R world map, and then I had to do a little bit of matching because my, the data never come in clean. So what happens is the codification of how the strains were given countries didn't have the same names as in my um, our world map. So I have to do a match of that. But then also I have the coordinates now, longitude and latitude of the data. And so this is what happens if I make a graph, I put my minimum spanning tree here between, and so I've, I've considered as the country, the capital. Um, and so in this, map or network I have. So this is um, Australia, this is Sweden, this is Canada, this is the US, um, and I'm going to map this on. But what you see is you only have one edge between the different capitals. And if I put ggplots nice like that, because you can look at actually what's going on by putting in a transparency here, I put in alpha equals um, 0 0.3 instead of alpha equals one, I can see that some of the edges are much stronger. So this means that there are multiple um, uh, edges between the same nodes and so this is the problem that you have overlapping. That is each uh, strain collection was assigned to the capital of the country when in fact uh, it wasn't really true. So um, you can see that the original graph has hidden the fact that I have multiple edges here. I could put in multiple edges um, by curving them, 
But really what I'm going to do, in fact, is I'm going to do the changes at the level of the nodes. And I'm going to jitter the points here on the graph um, to correspond to different, um, to different collection of samples. So for, I'll have as many points as I have samples. So this is what I did in this case. That is, I had uh, maybe 14 samples from Canada. I made 14 different points. And then you can see uh, where the connections are um, and where it's connected to. So here we had some cases from China um, and some cases from Taiwan. Here between the United States, it was China. Um, from Sweden, we have cases that went to the US or back or forth. There was connections. And then um, say um, Sweden to South Africa, we had events from Brazil to um, Africa to Zimbabwe, and we have some events. That, so you can see that this minimum spanning tree, it was constructed um, to connect to, together where we thought the strains were um, um, going back and forth. And we're seeing a lot of this occurring as we follow COVID, um, but being able to map it onto the world map, you can see the connection. So the graph has a meaning. Now we had to do quite a lot of work here. Um, and because uh, I had to make uh, a position for each of the countries. And so I've hidden uh, a little bit, some of that work that I did um, but in order to make one label per country. And um, I cheated because I made jitters of about the same size for many different sets of samples. Now we didn't have a lot of samples. It's very bias sampling. We only have, we have an open source database and doctors um, upload their strains in order to find out about drug resistant mutations. And we work a lot with some countries and very little with others. So there were very few strains from India or Iran. We had quite a lot of strains from Brazil, Mexico, and the US. So it's, this is not statistically correct sample, but it's the sort of problem that we like to do. And so I put in um, you could bend or di make diagonals and you could try out um, a different networks um, and see how you could improve this graph. Um, since I did this work, I also discovered a beautiful um, package, set of packages, which I didn't have you upload because it actually um, uh, requires quite a large installation, but there's, um, uh, there are, there are other packages here. Let me show that to you here for doing routing and setting edge weights. Um, so I really like this. Uh, uh, this is, you have uh, graphs, but you also have, again, the geographical coordinates, and then you can decide to make shortest paths for going from one place to the other. So I, I think that um, ah, the R, ah, landscape is amazing. So there was original this spatial functions SF um, uh, package, and then somebody has now made the SF network package, which allows you to do routing. And I discovered this, this is quite a recent vignette from this package, but I'm just amazed at how much um, things are developed in order to be able to do um, geo geographic graphs as well as the ones that we're doing. Um, so I encourage you, you know, there are lots and lots of opportunities here for, for looking at um, graphs which have spatial coordinates. Now, what are we going to do and what do we do with things like the minimum spanning tree that I just talked to you about? And I'm going to show you some examples of actually using those. Um, and maybe before I go, if there were some urgent questions uh, that um, you'd like to ask um, before I talk about the uh, PhiloSeq or something like that, maybe I can take a few uh, question or two, which not general questions, just more particular questions about making the graph um, with geography or some other aspect. So I haven't monitored the chat. Let me bring it up. Um, Susan, I can assist you. 
So, yeah. so there, there are three questions. Two of them are a bit more general, so I'll leave them to the end because they're actually really nice questions that can take a right. bit of time. But there's one quick question that you can answer. Yeah, um, that's uh, someone asked. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the who. Yeah, Rajesh asks, um, how do you can you change the color of the nodes? Because I think those colors that you chose they were automatic. Yeah. Um, is yes. it possible to change it? Uh, absolutely, and actually um, here. So it depends on which framework, but in the iGraph framework, I changed the, the nodes, you know, from purple to coral, um, just to show you the example where we did this. Here, I the nodes, I put vertex.color is purple, and then before I'd done coral. So you can do it here in the iGraph setting. And uh, you can do it in a richer way in the ggplot setting here, I put um, the nodes uh, here, color is, this is the name of the country. So that was a categorical variable and you can have the colors be either fixed to some, you know, I could have green for everybody or I can have a name or variable here and this was the colors were the countries. So I think that um, answers that sort of and that's the kind of question that I wanted to make sure that everybody's on board with with what mm. I was doing. But um, yeah, yeah. And can you um, you can obviously choose another color map, so you can yeah. control as well. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. So, so you, you would in ggplot. Right, exactly right. So everything. So the nice thing about this new framework is that ggplot. Um, both the tidy graph packages and the Gigi network, they build on the ideas behind ggplot where you, you do this in layers or in, in stages. So you can color the edges. So in this case, I have um, edges, for instance, that I colored in black, but I put um, them a little bit transparent. Um, I put in a little bit of curvature in as well. And so you have a special geom um, for edges and nodes, which don't exist in ordinary ggplot, but are for these frameworks. So this is um, in both the tidy graph, so the library, the ggGraph, and the gg network allow you to do that. And so here I had um, node text, or I had node colors, node point. And so here you see that I used for the nodes um, a color. And this color in this case was corresponding to the country, but also I, I changed the size. And you could make the size also depend on the degree as I did before. Um, and the fact that here I have all the same size, but I have blobs corresponds to the fact that I actually have these these uh, hedgehogs where I have many, many color countries which are very close and they're creating these blobs so um and that's what you see if you don't put the nodes here you can see that there are many many um edges of these hedgehogs here but um so it's it's helpful to look at the the graph without the um, the nodes first to look at its structure and then look at it afterwards with the nodes so um, i think that's helpful um, and so this is the remapping that I did um, to the world. Um, again, it's the graph, but it, it's mapped with a spatial context. So if there aren't any um, more of those kind of questions, I'm going to go to a different type of um, graph that we use a lot in the abundance data. And this could be in ecology, but it also could be um, in social networking. Um, and where you have a lot of sharing between people and um, co-occurrence would be um, that there's a sharing of a lot of um, qualities or objects in common, which help us create um, a special kind of graph called a co-occurrence graph. So the kind of co-occurrence graph I'm going to study uh, has to do with bacterial communities and um, we wrote package to make that very easy to do um, called PhiloSeq. And I'm, I have a special kind of object that I'm going to read in. 
And you can see this is a multi-component or a list type object in which I have different bacteria taxa. So, and a different number of samples. So my graph in this case is going to be a graph where the nodes are the samples. And I'm going to connect two samples if they share a lot of bacteria in common. And a shortcut to doing that is computing what we call the jacquard distance, which is a, a distance which measures um, count what is present as important. Now it can be present in both samples that you're comparing, or it could be present in one sample and not the other sample, or in one sample and not the other sample. But the the species which are not don't occur in either of the samples, they're just ignored. That's the jacquard distance. That's how it works. So we we use the jacquard distance as our default. And in general, we make, um, we make, uh, 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 we're going to try and make a, 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 a graph. Um, and let me see as an experiment, if I can make this interaction uh, work. Um, and I'm not sure about it uh, because it might complain about the data again. Um, so I, I try to run the code. Uh, and you should try and run the code too, just to see if you can um, try and do it as well. Um, what I want to show you is that um, when we are using uh, this particular package, uh, PhiloSeq, we ha have actually made a network with a jacquard distance in just one, um, one fell swoop in some sense. So it's not working in my shiny. It might be that it's a little bit slow. Let me make sure that I have the data um, that I read it in. And it might be that that's slow. Here it is. There's the data. This is this object. And then I'm, go I'm going to just cut and plot this and do it in my window. Um, I have found that this, the, uh oh, sorry, library. Let's see. Let's see that. Good and so I'm going to show you the plot. Hopefully, it'll work. Um, there we go. No, it's not appearing. Oh, there it is. Okay, so here is a network. Um, I, I, I like to show this because um, we wrote the package so that you didn't have to do too many complicated manipulations. You could just plot the network in one line. And what it, is it plotting? Um, as I said, every one of the nodes is a different sample. And I put the color is the color of the host. So in this case, these are mice. And the different mice have different colors. Uh, so here, I put an edge between two nodes, if they share uh, more than, say, 70% um, of the bacteria in common. So the maximum distance, and then the default of this is the jacquard distance. Is, so the maximum distance is uh, 0.3. It means that there's 70% sharing. So they're sharing uh, bacteria in common, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's one minus the index for the, the sharing. So the distance is large if they're very different. So um, a small distances means that there's a lot of sharing. And here, what you notice is the edges, the majority of edges are between nodes of the same color. So here you see these two are not the same color and that's what I would call a hybrid edge, but this is what I would call a pure edge. They're the same, the nodes are the same color um, on my graph. And what you can ask, and this was a clever test that was invented by Jerry Friedman and uh, Frank Brasky, is 
are the number of edges, uh, pure edges, um, random? Or do we have more pure edges than what we would expect if they were randomly assigned? And so this is called the friedman rafsky test. And I'm going to explain a little bit of um, the history behind that, but this is how, um, this is the, the way that works. Now, if, it, yes, you have a question. Somebody had a question, no, okay. Um, good, good. Um, so th this is uh, what we're going to use it for later on. But I also included all the code if you wanted to do it by hand with iGraph or TidyGraph, um, and you can try running that code. Um, mine has now gone to sleep. My run code thing um, is not working. So. so I'm just going to pause for a minute. So I asked this question about my graph, and this is the first step in some sense to doing actual statistics on graphs. That is asking a question about significance of the graph as it relates to some kind of factor variable. Now, where did Jerry Friedman get his idea? I think it's helpful to think about the, uh, the one dimensional case where you don't have a graph but where we have a non-parametric test, which is called the runs test, in which, for instance, you might look at uh, measurements um, in uh, men and women, and uh, you decide whether the red group, um, the men, uh, are different than the women in this measurement. And so in making this um, test, using this test, we might want to, um, we could do it by doing the mean and looking at the difference, but that wouldn't be non-parametric. And so what the runs test is, what it asks is whether we have a sequence of several of the shapes of the same color, um, which occur more often the ones in which we have a switch of color. So in this case, this is called a run, we a hybrid run, but we have a switch of color. Uh, but here, red to red, and actually there are two red triangles there. So it'd be red, 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 that would be three in a row. And then we have a hybrid run. So Volfovix um, computes the number of runs and then finds out whether there's a significant amount of um, uh, pure runs compared to the hybrid ones. So in this case, you see a grouping on the left of the blues. And so you see a lot of um, pure runs. That's how that works. And Terry Friedman had the idea um, to do this. And instead of talking about runs, we talk about edges. This is the edges in this very simple path graph. And he had the idea of doing it on the big graph. So if you want to do that test, We've implemented a, a Julia Fukuyama, who was a graduate student with me, um, has made a package called Philo C graph test, which enables you to compute the minimum spanning tree, for instance, and then look at the number of connections which are pure compared to the ones that you would expect. So here we have a minimum spanning tree, um, which is made on um, Jekka similarity. And the question you can ask is, um, how many pure edges do you have compared to the hybrid edges? So is there a big difference as opposed to the factor variable? And you can do a test and she made this nice plot which shows you here we have the edges in full lines which are pure edges and then we have dotted edges which are not pure. And so the hybrid edges here and you can count them so we have the mixed edges and the pure edges as they appear on this minimum spanning tree. And then I can do the permutation test. So how would you do a permutation test? Well, what we do is we keep the same graph the same and we reassign the labels at random. So we just reassign all the label colors here. And we then we look at the number of pure edges that you get um, in a simulation. And maybe you do that a thousand times. So in this calling up this um, function, this permutation test here, I, I said to do it a thousand times. And this tells me the tree that I, I make. 
So here, if I look, um, we observe um, 149 pure edges for 343 total edges, and the permutation value is very small. And if you look at the histogram of the number of pure edges you would expect at random, it's situated around 30. Um, and here you see that the actual number was um, 149. And so it's way out in the tail. So the p-value is very, very small. So this is an example of doing statistics using a graph and uh, a permutation histogram. Here we've done a different graph. Um, we made a network, which is um, a network, a threshold network with co-occurrence. And again, you can ask the same question. You can do the permutation test and um, we find that there's a significant uh, relationship between both actually the, um, identi the identity of the mouse, but also the litter in which the mouse be belonged to. So we did permutation tests and nested permutation tests. And that's just an example I'd say of how would you use um, a graph and do statistics on it and at the same time explore it. I'm going to end the sort of formal workshop here. Um, what, uh, what I showed you um, definitely comes from um, the book, um, as I showed you before. Um, you have many, many more exercises in the book. And so we did many different kinds of graphs. And in particular, there's a very um, nice way of looking at um, significance in graphs. If you have given to you by string a very, very large gene interaction network, you can find the subgraph with um, the biggest score. And the scores can be given to you by differential expression or by a specific test that you do. So you're able to find a subgraph which is meaningful. And um, this is available through a very nice um, package called Bionet. And I won't go into details about that, but it's definitely in the chapter. So of course, I'm most interested, the way I work, I work a lot with phylogenetic trees. I'm interested in tree graphs and I left out that whole part um, and we can talk about that more as we get to um, talking about how, you know, the phylogenetic relationships of HIV and COVID are very important. And so that's another kind of graph for, for, for which we have very nice um, data. And I won't talk about that. I just open the floor to more questions and see what you're interested in. Um, but that that was um, th that was the the references and the examples. And of course, there's a wonderful tutorial um, which is available um, for tidy graph now um, that Thomas Sinison has developed, and it's his new package, and he's been developing it through. Um, so this is Tibble graph objects. And so it's uh, enrichment of the iGraph object. So it, it uses iGraph, uh, but it makes um, tidy objects for graphs. And so I've adapted some of the examples to use this Tibble graph notion. But for all of you who know the tidyverse, you will feel most uh, comfortable with, the, with this setup, I think. Um, I think that would be um, a, good, a good way to start. And so I'll um, I'll finish um, the network the network uh, demonstration at least, or let you tell me what you what you have trouble with or the questions that you have. I'll stop there. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I'm just scrolling up to make sure I'm not missing questions. Uh, okay. It, so they're very interesting questions. I think they're really about um, applying um, graphs. So okay. this first one is from Adikari, I hope I said it right, um, asks, if I want to apply social network analysis to a business organization, how can I, or I suppose, how should I collect data uh, from that organization? Um, so I presume it's a format type of question. Right. So um, first of all, there's an amazing package for doing social network analysis, and that's a whole suite of packages called StatNet. 
Um, so that I'll just put it on here so that you can see it written down. Um, so it uh, uses iGraph. Um, it was actually one of the reasons that iGraph was developed, but you can see there are a whole set of packages for doing um, social network analysis. And in general, um, social networks are just like um, biology. You don't come in the door with the network. You're not told what the network is. And it's very difficult, you know, friendship networks, for instance, you might ask people, you know, who are your friends, but they won't remember, you know, who their friends are. And so um, we often build, you can build um, social networks by, for instance, um, email, using email flow or um, finding out information about what they share in common. So you have co-occurrence of, um, uh, of having things in common will make a certain type of network. So the question of, you know, if you want to study connections, um, usually we do it, as I said, the Enron, uh, there was a nice uh, example, which was the Enron email database when it became available people were doing a lot of social network analysis on that and um, so of course the people who have the most data for doing social network analysis are um, the big companies so facebook in particular and google who knows all our email and everything they can do very very developed social network there's a question about data privacy there um, which is you know which is true for all the social sciences and what you have to suppose is that if you're using email and if you're using social media then everything is already um, out there everything's public but people use twitter data a lot there are packages for doing twitter data as well um, for creating social networks. Um, and so that there are lots of ways of doing that. Um, and uh, right. uh, so, Anna, any other question? Yes, there are. There's quite a few. Um, so the next one is from Iranti. And I hope I said your name right. Um, she, are, she or he asks, what inferences could be made on the results from the network analysis of HIV and COVID-19 performed independently? And then there's a second question about what network properties could be explored from the HIV network and the COVID network. Well, um, the HIV, we were interested in how so this was before COVID, before you know, people realized how important this was epidemiologically, but we were interested in how the strains both were evolving across the world and how they were circulating. And um, you know, the knowing where the strains are going and where they came from was really important because uh, the drug regimens in different countries are different and um, the drug resistance that builds up depends on the mutations. And so you might have a certain type of drug resistance that builds up in Brazil. And then um, you need, if you have a lot of the strains going from Brazil, say to Australia, you need to tell the Australians about the drug resistance that is going on in Brazil. And we see exactly the same thing with COVID. That is, we have these variants of interest, which are different strains. And the strains have different properties. So the UK strain, for instance, is more contagious and has taken over parts of Europe. Um, and, but it turns out they've done trials and for the vaccination, the vaccines work well with that strain. The only thing that the, the consequences, for instance, what's happening now in Italy is that, and what happened in Portugal in January is that they had to close down the country much faster because what we call the R um, contagion number um, was bigger for that version of the virus. So one of the things is, 
um, these illnesses, because they evolve, because the bacteria or the viruses um, evolve, the, the, the properties evolve. So you can't say um, this disease has a, a, an R, which is fixed at 1.8. That doesn't work. It's very heterogeneous on this, and it depends on the strain. It also depends on the climate and the country and many environmental factors to do with the, also um, the heat and the dry. And um, so um, you can, and so statistics is very useful. And um, I wrote a paper with Claire Donat um, on the variability of the COVID-19 um, epidemiologically. That is, it's not just one constant R number, it's a random variable. And for statisticians, of course, we have ways we can make a Bayesian framework for doing that random number. But it, it, when you're doing worst case analysis or predictive scenarios, the randomness is important. And the same for HIV, that is knowing um, where the strains were coming from is very important in um, adapting to the treatment and especially for the drug resistance and the treatment. Maybe Thanks, I'll... Susan. Yeah. I think we could talk about COVID-19 analysis for forever. Right. Right. No, I, <laughs> and I, I, we I, will I, be. <laughs> no, yeah, but I mean, I was just talking about the network side. The network side of things is really important. I think it's useful, so. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, there's another question here from Isabella. Yeah. Um, apologies for the people asking questions. Vibash and I, or mostly me, have done them in a different order, but they will all get answered. Okay, so Isabella's question is, given the different representations of data in a network, the edges and the nodes, how do you best frame the meaning of the data to a general audience? What are some strategies to best communicate what the data displayed in a network means in the context of a hypothesis or research question? That's a quite a nice practical question. Yeah, but actually my use of network was driven by the biologists because when we were doing, say, gene expression studies or transcriptomics where you say the, these genes are more expressed than those genes and you gave them a list, the biologist would say, this list is meaningless to me. What does it mean um, biologically? And it was them that framed it in terms of networks. That is, they know which genes interact and they have pathways, genetic pathways, which are well documented. So you have a skeleton graph. And what we did was we mapped our statistical data onto pathways that they understand. So the biologists, they were holding in some sense, the key to the network, you have to use the relevant networks that they understand. So for instance, for metabolic pathways, you have networks or pathways between chemicals, which are well documented and um, well understood. When I communicate a picture like the one that I have right um, up here, um, I think the most important thing is to say, the nodes in this case are samples and the edges are sharing. That means these samples share a lot of bacteria in common. So you have to explain exactly what the nodes and what the edges are. But then afterwards, um, people understand networks very well. It's a very good way of communicating information as opposed to just tables of numbers. And so, of course, there, there are thresholds, there are values that you choose, you make the network. If I change the threshold, I get a different network. So you have to explain that um, sensitivity in some sense to your network, how much it's, um, uh, how much it changes. But I think communicating and making nice pictures of graphs is a very good way of illustrating what's going on. Some of the testing is a little bit uh, more difficult. I showed you the case of a non-parametric test with which I've had a lot of success because people intuitively understand permutation tests, but I don't have trouble communicating graphs the way I have um, communicating multivariate data with mixtures and more complex situations. I'm, I'm very fond of using graphs because my, um, my, my collaborators like them a lot.
Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Um, there's one other question, uh, and Inga, I don't know if uh, there's other ones that are here. I think we do have one new one. Um, so Fazwan asks, do you think this graphical visualization also works for metabolomics? I hope I said that right. Oh yeah, well, of course. We use it all the time for metabolomics because the in metabolomics the the we have the as I said the metabolites the chemicals um, they already have pathways which are well characterized so we have a very good way of mapping the data onto metabolic pathways and there are databases of metabolic pathways on which we are able to we are able to use as our skeletons so metabolomics is a very good um, area for using um, networks and and chemists and computational chemists are used to networks so it's definitely a good area um, on which to work um, so. thanks susan um I, I typed in the in the chat any other questions and, and now they're coming so it's very encouraging <laughs> um adikari asks if you want to apply network analysis um or model amongst migrant workers from a state to another state within the same country, how can I collect data? Um, that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, so what you're asking me is not, is sort of very, very difficult um, because of course there are privacy and uh, issues about, you know, people don't want to, very often they don't want to say they're going from one country to another. So there's a lot of um, hiding of that data. If, uh, you know, there's a big brother side to this. And that's why I said that the technical companies, um, those for instance, which use, um, which provide us with WhatsApp um, and tools like that, they have a way of knowing through geolocation um, the mobility of people. So this has come in a lot um, on an agglomerated level in European countries. People were trying to find out whether there was um, respect of the lockdown. And in particular, there were some countries which were closed and some countries that were open, but they were uh, the governments were using cell phone data to find out um, for tracking people as they cross borders. So you have that um, option of creating those networks of finding out. Um, and so you have the, the location on the cell phone and then you also have um, the people who call. So you have the call network. So that type of data, uh, the network data will tell you a lot. Um, so so of course that's a, that's a difficult, um uh ethical question uh, so if you were looking at state um i see the follow-up you're looking for uh, within state um in the us um the government or the states were using a lot of cell phone data to find out um as they were trying to follow actually what was going on with covid um the mobility of people across state lines so um, that's definitely one of the ways. Um, geolocation is a, a, a way within the state. But also you could have a, a, the um, credit card information and various other sources. When people pull out money from the bank, they, they do get followed also. So, so those sources of information, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're all privacy. It's very tricky because normally you'd have to do um, something which is agglomerate. Um, so for the mobility data, people did it by agglomerating the data, not saying looking at individuals, but they could see that in spite of, you know, California was locked down and they could see people leaving the state. So they would go to another part of the country. Um, I just want to add to that because we've been doing a bit of spatial COVID modeling here in South Africa and we we struggled. So we got some cell phone data, um, but also aggregated, as you say, 
but it's not representative because you have a number of cell phone networks um, and now we're having trouble using it and it's not giving good results because of that. But then we came across, um, and I'll try to find the link and put it in the chat now. There's a Facebook a data site that they've put up, which is anonymized, um, and it, it's got the whole country, uh, it's mobility, um, the whole world, sorry, mobility between, uh, at, I think it's sort of like a district level, obviously different across the world, which is actually quite nice. Um, I'll share that. Obviously, it's, it's not who, so it's not necessarily migrant workers or all of that, but, it, but it's very nice data sets there. Uh, I'll share it now. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, it's cer certainly the case that we're, you know, we're all struggling with, with data sources. And of course, the biases are enormous because when I say we're using the cell phone data, then of course, we're ignoring all the people who don't have cell phones. And so, you know, there's this huge bias in the sampling um, of how that is done. So you need several different perspectives, that's for sure. Um, there is a question I see about um, something that I didn't go through, um, which I'm perfectly happy to come back to, um, which had to do with, um, with what I said um, earlier about how do you find the significant subnetworks in a graph. And so um, it might be that you have, um, in general, what happens is, and this is um, this part of the, of the book, but um, in general, if you're looking at differential expression and you're trying to relate a known network. So in this case, we have two different things. We have one set of data, which is a known network between um, genes. And so that's something like what the string database um, provides me with. Um, here, you know, I showed you this example, um, but I could have had a much bigger network. Um, and so for instance, in the settings, I could have said, uh, I wanted to have maybe low confidence and um, I could go with many more um, interactions. And that, that would provide a much bigger network of potential interactions. And so we use this as our basis skeleton network. And then what happens is once we know this, then we map a differential expression um, p-value or minus log of the p-value or a t-statistic onto each of the nodes. And so you're, you're given a network and then you have nodes and they have a score on them. And you want to try and find the subgraph, which has um, a subnetwork, which is the most perturbed uh, by the illness, for instance. So in that case, we have um, a subgraph that you look for, and we use a model of what the you know the differences might be in the p-values. In this case, were fit to a, a beta binomial model, but then we found the hotspots. This subgraph we started off, um, as I said, we, we had a graph between 3,583 genes, and then we find a subgraph, a subnetwork, which is the one which is most perturbed. And it might be that they're up or down. It doesn't mean that everything is up or everything is down. It might be um, we use the absolute value of the T statistics. So you could have this subgraph. And then this would tell you. So this gives a way of finding or mapping your diseases onto, um, onto a graph. And it's not a correlation network. So sometimes people only build a correlation network that is the showing the genes which just work together. But you might, a perturbation network shows things that don't work together things which are um, negatively correlated or working against each other, but the things which are the most perturbed. But so, so sometimes this is very, very uh, useful when you're watching over time um, how things are changing and you want to change point, for instance, in the, in the phenomena. Um, so I don't know whether that uh, answers Aranti's question. Wait a minute, I, I see it. Um, so uh, should we use co-occurrence um, 
Uh, right. So usually we don't use comorbidities uh, or co-occurrence. We just use transcriptomics, which we map onto the network. Um, now, um, I do want to say something which I haven't said very clearly, and I'm sorry for the, you know, I'm trying to tell you too much at once is probably the case, but this network is a network between genes. It's not a network between the samples, the computation of the difference, the differential expression was done on the samples. So in, I like to say that there are dual network approaches. That is, you can make a connection between the variables that you measure, as you do here, or you can make connections, as I did with co-occurrence, between the samples on which you do the measurements. And they're dual of each other because you have both measurements. Um, you have the observations, the samples, and you have the variables. So in the case of what I do in, uh, let me show, uh, go back to my, there we are. Um, when, when I'm looking at um, networks of the human microbiome, when I showed you here, I have a network of the samples. These were connected because they shared a lot of taxa. But I could do something different, um, and I can go and um, see if I can go to it. Um, I could do something different. I could also make a network between different bacteria. So in this case, um, this can be done uh, in in by saying that what I'm interested in is not the samples, but the species. And so you can, you can plot and look at that um, in what we call the dual way. And so there's a choice in make network and plot network. And let me show you on the code um, when I make network, make network. Um, you have a choice between whether to do it um, between type equals samples, and then the other one is type equals taxa. Network, um, which is not, uh, so here I took the, I'm going to do this. Uh, and then I can say uh, type equals taxa. It might complain because I didn't test this. Um, and I'm not quite sure that, uh, and then, uh, so I could, uh, so here, I'm just going to do this uh, live. And so then I'm going to plot the network. Uh, that. Okay. I don't know, there might be too many species, so it might be really a mess. Uh, there's a lot of species, but what it has, um, what it's, putting together, and this is very interesting, it's the variables in this case are the taxa. And this is the taxa which co-occur together in many of the samples. And so that would tell you a community or guild of bacteria which are co-occurring in the sample. So you see, this is a, this is a dual and so you can make the other network. So some of the time we make networks between the variables. And that's, for instance, when people do um, what we call graphical models, they're always making networks between variables. I showed you most of my examples were not graphical models in that sense. They were models in which I have network networks between the samples or the people or the strains. And so at the observation level. Um, I, I don't know, but I, that, that might answer some of the questions. So I see there are more. Um, are there any other questions? Um, do you, um, I'm going to, we can finish off or if there are general questions or. I think uh, there may be just one more question if I'm not missing anyone. Um, so Isabella asked, how do you best extract a sub network of interest from a larger network? Um, so from the whole data set without losing information that was established within the whole data set. 
so so the, the example that I just showed you in which I had a score and I use an algorithm which finds the subnetwork which has the highest score. So usually in that case, you have to, of course, fix a size for the subnetwork you want or an approximate size. So suppose I started off with 3,500 genes. Then I want to find a network with 300 genes, which has the maximum score. Now it turns out, I said earlier on in the talk, um, some things involving networks are expensive. The subgraph with the highest score problem is one of those problems. It's um, to do it exactly, you'd have to go through all the possible subgraphs, which is exponentially many. And so um, it's an expensive problem for which we have very good heuristics. So there's a heuristic approximation, which is available in this Bionet package that I talked about, um, which I showed you on the book. On the, so um, Bionet. And that's um, uh, this is the, the this is this package which enables you to go through um, and find a subgraph with a higher score. But you have to have some extra data about the nodes, which gives you a score. And so it finds that that subgraph with the property of having the highest perturbation score or the highest score of a certain kind. And um, but you need clever algorithms in this case because it's expensive. It's equivalent to the knapsack problem and it can be quite expensive. But we 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 do have good um, graph algorithms for doing that. So it's a good question and it's an interesting um, inferential problem afterwards because once you've chosen the optimal subgraph how can you decide that it's significant? Because you found the optimal one. Well, you're always going to find a good one because you you that's the way you did it. And so you have to do bootstrap or things which are quite expensive. And it's a hard problem, but it's interesting. Okay. I think that's all for the questions. I hope I didn't okay. miss anyone. Um, but thank you so much for your talk. Everyone is um, very positive on the chat and is thanking you for your talk, for your answers as well. Um, so for answering all the questions so comprehensively. And so I think Iranti said that, um, sorry for all the questions, but networks are very fascinating. And I think yeah. that's a shared sentiment by the audience. Thank you so much That's good. to see you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It was a good um, exercise for me to try to share some of the excitement I have about networks. And it's just that it's a non-standard data structure. So I, you know, it's a non-standard type of plot and non-standard type of testing that I haven't seen a lot of material. Um, there is a lot of material starting to be developed by specialists, but I think that we can all use it in our work. So I think it's good. And uh, I was very happy to meet you all. And, uh, and I hope that, you know, your continuation of Our Ladies in Africa will be um, successful. And uh, it, it's, it's great to see you all. And I encourage, you know, uh, you see, I put up material. I was trying things out as well. So my experiment with Learner, I, uh, I hope you excuse the, I hope that some of you were able to download uh, uh, and follow along some way. I don't know who who tried on their computers. Put your hand up if you tried on the computer and it actually worked. Uh, some of you were able to, so that's good. Because um, I was experimenting too, and I had various problems with. Because I thought it was very cool to be able to code in the slide, and then I realized, oh, but you had to have initialized everything really well before, and you mustn't, you mustn't skip any of the ones because otherwise it doesn't support that. But it's a good experiment for me because um, in teaching we try to teach on Zoom now. And I, you know, trying to make it more lively, it's deadly. The students are going to be listening to six hours of Zoom a day. You know, this is awful. <laughs> it's just no human interaction. And so, so I, I thank you for being my, my experimental audience and a very positive one at that. So this is great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Susan, for that amazing, amazing talk. And it really went well. Even if you say you're testing, it actually really went well. 
And we have when people suggesting us to plan another meetup on metabolic. So it's really interesting and uh, we're really grateful for these. Um, thank you, thank you so much also for the amazing questions that we've had. Uh, they were pretty uh, detailed and also very uh, well answered. So thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you so much. So we just have a final led to this uh, workshop uh, and that will be the closing remarks uh, uh, to be uh, made by Camilla and also the launch of uh, Ladies Africa uh, today. Go ahead, Camilla. Thanks. Okay, hi Faith, uh, thank you. Hi everyone and uh, I, um, I wanna thank um, Dr. Susan for this great uh, talk. Uh, thank you uh, for LADs Nairobi for this initiative and this collaboration. Thank you, Air Ladies, Chonis, Abuja, and uh, Josie for this great collaboration and this great initiative to create the Air Ladies Africa. So I'm so happy to be the honored to, um, to present our um, logo, our uh, logo of Air Ladies uh, Africa. And I hope that it will be uh, um, this first and not a last uh, meetup between these five groups and inshallah another group from Morocco or um, Libya and we hope to see uh, all of the um, groups created so I had to say to um, people that they are uh, they are with us if you want to create uh, chapters in your um, cities we are here to help and you don't have only to uh, contact us and we help you to do it. So um, thank you everyone to being here. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, um, Mr. Mrs. Suzanne again. Um, I hope that we, we had learned uh, something and everyone had learned uh, something. Thank you for the, your questions and thank you, uh, Suzanne, for the, the, the response. So um, see you later and in another um, another uh, workshop or uh, meetups. Um, so thank you everyone on behalf of Ladies Africa. Thank you, thank you so much, Camila. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Susan, for this and. Uh, We'll be back uh, with more as our ladies Africa and any anyone in Africa in a city that you want to start off uh, our ladies group. We are really here to help you. Uh, as personally, uh, if it, it wasn't for the Bashni from our ladies Josie, I don't think our ladies Nairobi will be here. So it's just about uh, reaching out, uh, uh, just asking those questions and uh, we're going to help you start this so that you can have a bigger this connection of R. Uh, if you know anyone or you are anyone that uh, I feel like you can do a meetup, uh, just share your ideas, be the speaker on a topic that you feel you're really good at, kindly reach out to us, uh, either as our ladies Africa or any of the groups and you're going to plan a meetup. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you again, Dr. Susan. I don't think I can say enough thanks for that. Uh, uh, we were really honored to have you. Uh, the recording is going to be up, uh, I think, by end of today or tomorrow, uh, latest, on uh, Our Ladies Gro Global YouTube channel. So we are going to share the links with you. Uh, we have your emails, so kindly share it widely and uh, I, uh, and uh, review review it uh, to your satisfaction. So thank you so much and. Uh, say bye you can switch on your mics and videos and say bye then you can leave it your own pleasure thank you bye everyone i don't know where, where okay. thank you bye bye everyone thank you